<coughs> Hi, so we make energy storage devices, They're mostly batteries and supercapacitors, and we mostly make those out of graphene. Now, to do that, of course, we need lots of graphene. And something occurred to me as I was working on this that would be really, I thought, really, really useful. And that is how that methodology that we use could be used in graphite mining to improve the yield of graphite mines and the quality of the product of graphite mines. So I plan on talking a little bit about the graphene, a little bit about the method that we use, a little bit about graphite mining and how that method should be able to fit in with mining to achieve those objectives. Now obviously I've shown lots of ways of making graphene on YouTube and none of those are really suitable. They all have kind of problems associated with them for the mass production of graphene. And we use a different method. And we've always used a different method and I've never told anybody what the method that we use actually is. And obviously I have no intention of telling you exactly what that method is for very good reasons. It's um, a very valuable method and like everybody we hope to sell it we hope to do something with it so we can earn income from it so there's no way that i'll be telling you everything about our method and you can't really and honestly expect me to i've given lots of demonstrations on how to make graphene and how to investigate graphene for yourself and to come up with their own methods we use our own specific method now because we have to produce so much of it then the way we have to do it has to be cheap and it has to be set. And what we actually do is we take the graphite and we put it in this solution. This solution actually dissolves the graphite. So it peels off the plates and holds them in solution. Then all I have to do is, once I've done that, is uh, leave it to sediment for a bit, uh, usually a day or two, throw away the sediment or rerun the sediment, depending on the quality of the graphene, take the material that I've got there and then filter it out and what I'm left with is a pure graphene. It's one of the few things that I've bothered to send off for analysis because analysis is quite expensive. So we've got SEM images of it, we've got XRD, we've got Raman to show that this is in fact graphene that we get in the solution. So we end up with our graphene solution, we filter it, give it a wash and, and that's what we use. But as I say, it occurred to me that what we were doing actually would be more useful than just in making graphene. Now, crystalline carbons occur in two main forms, and that's graphite and, and um, diamond. Of course, there are lots of other forms of carbon, but there are two main forms of crystalline carbon. And of the graphite, there are really only three forms that you find, and that's amorphous and large flake and vein graphite. Those are the three main kinds. They're formed, really, as uh, organic deposits in sediments that undergo metamorphism. And depending on the nature of that, will depend on what that actually looks like as the final graphite that we dig out of the ground. Now with vein graphite, and or large flake they often call it, what it's thought to be is the volatilization of the um, original graphite into cracks and then the recrystallization. So you find vein graphite in cracks. I don't know if anybody remembers, I had quite a lot of involvement with Sri Lankan mine about four years ago, then we did some videos down the mine, and those veins you could actually see as little cracks going through the rock, and they can vary in width from a few millimetres to six, 12 inches. So they're quite dramatic and they're very um, interesting to see, and they're a peculiar formation, and you don't find them everywhere. Uh, Sri Lanka's the main place, and, and I think there are two other places. Cumbria used to be one, and I think there's one in Canada, I'm not sure. But you don't find it very much. What you mostly find is an awful lot of flake graphite. These are uh, individual crystals that have formed in the rock and are locked in with the rock. So if you pick a, uh, pick a piece up and slice through it, you'll see graphite flakes dotted around that rock of relatively large size. The amorphous graphite is thought to be a metamorphic formation from things like coal. And it forms a very black and sooty material, which is kind of like 60-70% graphite, and the rest is rubbish and that brings down the price of amorphous graphite because there's an awful lot of stuff in it that's quite hard to separate and normally when they're uh, mining flake graphite what they do is take the rock and crush it to what's called the liberation size that is the size at which the graphite flakes will just fall out and be free of the rock and no longer locked in that's quite a critical size because if you over crush it what you do is distort the graphite flakes and you smear them over everything else and of course you crush those quite small, so in the later separation stages it's actually quite hard to separate them because the smeared minerals now act like the graphite, so it becomes much harder. So they crush it down to the liberation size, and then they use something called flotation. Obviously graphite is naturally hydrophobic, 
So if you put it in water of the right size, it will just want to float. You add something else to the water, it tends to be kerosene. So kerosene's added. Um, they sometimes do a different pH, alkali pH, so they add uh, sodium hydroxide to help stabilize the foam. And there was something else that they add as well that I can't quite remember that helps for uh, foam formation. But basically, you drop it in the water with these few additives and it, it works better if they're starved. So not many additives, you drop them in the additives, they float on the top and you scoop them off. Now, there will be rock bound in with some of those graphite flakes because you can't crush it all down to the right size. So very often they do that and then do it again. So there are two wash processes. The first wash process, everything that drops to the bottom is scraped off and those are your tailings and they just get chopped away. On the second, you, the stuff that's at the bottom is called the middlings and, and they can have a value. And the final stuff can be as high as 94% um, concentrated graphite. And that's called graphite concentrate. And that's the stuff that tends to be characterized for later soil. So dig out of the ground, um, basically crush it, float it, clean it, and that's what you get. Now obviously it uses a lot of water, so sometimes it's not appropriate to do that, and they use an air system where they crush it to a certain size, put it through like a zigzag, blow air over it, and the graphite flakes will go over there into a cyclone, collect it at the bottom, and the heavier stuff drops out. And that air clarification can be used instead of the first flotation, and then you do a second flotation. So it cuts down an awful lot. Obviously the yield that you get from that is how much graphite you can get out of that original rock that you crushed up. And then the quality is how much is still left in there once you do the carbon content test, which is a really simple test. It's called loss on ignition. Um, graphite will actually begin to burn off somewhere between 400 and 600 in an oxidizing atmosphere. Everything you're left over with, uh, you weigh and you compare it and it'll give you the um, purity of the material that you've got. So it's a really simple test that's done. There is an extension to that test where if it's uh, an amorphous graphite and there are some volatiles in there, you preheat the volatiles. Now graphite itself will melt in a non-oxidizing condition at 3550 degrees and it's how they think vein graphite works. Incidentally, I think it's being volatilized and recrystallized at kind of at those temperatures. So that's a really interesting process, obviously very um, capital expensive. If you want to purify it beyond 94%, what they tend to do is uh, chemical leaching of any of the other stuff that's left in there, and that gives you the higher percentages. Now, it occurred to me that we're doing something that's really rather interesting, because there are lots of problems with that uh, process. You get a lot of smearing, a lot of losses on the actual rock itself. Um, if it's a particularly difficult or small size, so liberation is quite hard, then the overall yield can be very low in terms of the expense of running it. But if we chucked that middlings in there, or the extra, or the fine graphite that we get, we chucked it into the solvent and stirred it, then the graphite would um, dissolve, if you like. Actually, it peels off as flakes, but it would dissolve in the solvent, and all the other stuff would drop to the bottom. As I say, once it's dropped to the bottom, you collect this stuff here and filter it, and what you get back is uh, graphite. So it'd be a really cheap way of refining that graphite beyond its 94% or collecting extra graphite from the middlings, or making a particularly low source of graphite yield a higher source. Because this is, um, as I say, very cheap ingredients. It's reusable once you've filtered it, uh, and it's extraordinarily safe. You could actually drink that if you liked. It wouldn't do anything to you at all. You could, you could drink that if you wanted. Um, so really, really safe, reusable. And it struck me that integrating that into the mining process would enable a mining company to uh, improve the quality of what it was that we were mining, particularly if they have a low quality grade ore. And it would also allow them to produce something uh, that gives what's called value at the mine head. That is, you can make that product to be graphene and sell the graphene at really not very much in the way of capital expenditure. And a lot of this stuff would then go into the battery market. So that the main consumers of graphite are um, the furnaces, furnaces and foundries, uh, heat, that sort of stuff and um, batteries. The others are, are relatively minor. You've got things like flexible graphite for gaskets, that sort of stuff, lubrication, of course, um, fire intumescence, that kind of thing. But they're quite low. The two main ones are, are for uh, crucibles and furnaces and um, batteries. So it would certainly create a grade of graphite that could be used in batteries, and of course that's a key industry. So I thought this would be interesting to share with you in that we have a, a simple solution method for doing that, that is in improving quality, improving yield, and adding value at the mine head to any graphite product. 
And the reason I'm sharing that is I'm very interested in doing something with this. And I'll probably never by myself get around to doing it. So I'm looking to do this with somebody. Uh, and if there's anybody interested out there, then I would obviously be more than happy to talk to you about it. Uh, and we'd be looking at something like a uh, intellectual property transfer into the company in, for uh, shares, something like that. So if you're interested, then please do feel free to contact me. I'll put my email address actually in the description if you want to write. Uh, for everybody else, I hope that was of interest and thank you very much for watching.